Hello, my name is Dr. Simon Freilich, consultant in clinical neurophysiology. This video will explain distal ulnar neuropathy, also known as ulnar neuropathy at Guyon's Canal and ulnar tunnel syndrome. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to continue to refer to this condition as ulnar tunnel syndrome throughout the rest of this video. I will also explain how it is diagnosed and how experts generally recommend it is treated. Of course, any individual with this particular condition will need to have their treatment tailored to their specific needs in consultation with their doctor. This condition should not be confused with ulnar neuropathy at the elbow or cubital tunnel syndrome, which you can find out more about in a separate video if you click the link down below or the I card above. Let's first understand the anatomy. The ulnar tunnel is a small channel which is around 4 centimeters long at the wrist. The floor is formed by the transverse carpal ligament and the entrance by two bony protrusions which come up from the carpal bones beneath. These are called the hook of hamate and the pisiform bones. A couple of blood vessels run through this area as well called the ulnar artery and the ulnar vein. The ulnar nerve also joins this crowded space running up through this tunnel. Just before it does this, it sends a branch to the back of the hand called the dorsal ulnar cutaneous nerve. This can help us work out exactly where the lesion of the ulnar nerve may be occurring. More about this later on. There are three main branches, a superficial motor branch, which runs to the ADM muscle at the side border of the hand and opens the little finger out like so. There are sensory fibres to the little and half of the ring finger, which provide sensation, and a deep motor branch, which runs to the various intrinsic muscles of the hand, most importantly the first dorsal interosseous muscle here, which opens the first finger outwards. These are then covered by a hood, which is called the superficial palmar carpal ligament, which forms the roof of Guyon's canal. There are three zones where lesions can occur. Zone 1 occurs within Guyon's canal and all three branches are affected, so patients will get numbness of the fingers and global weakness of the hand. Zone 2, which is the most common, occurs just outside of Guyon's canal where the deep motor branch winds across the hook of hamate bone. This would cause weakness and wasting of most of the hand muscles but without numbness and should not affect little finger abduction. Zone 3 is the rarest form where only the sensory branches are impaired and would not be associated with any weakness. Having understood the anatomy and the three zones, let's think about the causes. This condition is found most commonly in patients who have chronic pressure placed on the distal wrist. This occurs most commonly among cyclists pushing on handlebars and also in patients who have occupations or hobbies where repetitive striking of the wrist against hard objects such as spanners occurs. Fractures of the hamate or the pisiform bones can also cause distortion of this space. Cysts, which are fluid-filled sacs, can form within the canal and actually account for around half of cases. Other causes include lipomas, muscle anomalies, fibrous bands, and a rare cause is ulnar artery aneurysms or thrombosis known as hypothena hammer syndrome. This can also lead to the blood vessels becoming engorged within this tight canal and compressing the nerve at this point. So how do we know if a patient has this type of nerve lesion? Firstly, we need to find out the symptoms and how they have developed. Weakness of the hand muscles, numbness of the little fingers isolated to the hand are the most important hallmarks. We seek to see if there are any obvious wrist swellings that we can see or feel that could indicate a cyst or a ganglion. Or any ischemic changes in the fingers, such as skin discolorations, which might suggest a problem with the ulnar artery. We look to see if there's any wasting of the muscles, which is apparent, such as guttering within the hand muscles, which should spare the median nerve innervated muscles at the base of the thumb. After we test the muscle power, we test sensation. It's really important to check that sensation is normal at the back of the hand. If it isn't, then the level of the lesion is probably higher up. I'm now going to show you a couple of tests to check that any weakness which you might have is related to the ulnar tunnel. First, I would like you to check the FDIO muscle. 
This opens the index finger outwards, and this should be weak in most cases of ulnar tunnel. Next, check the APB muscle, which lifts the thumb up like so. Make sure that this is strong. If so, then you are likely to have ulnar neuropathy. Finally, check sensation at the back of the hand compared to the little fingers. If this is normal compared to the front of the hand, then you are likely to have ulnar tunnel. There are a number of conditions which can have similar presentations, the most common of which is ulnar neuropathy at the elbow. This would cause numbness on the back of the hands as well, and lower cervical radiculopathy, which would tend to cause numbness extending beyond the wrist and down into the inner forearm. Nerve conduction studies are an important part of the investigations used to evaluate which nerve branches have been affected and what the level of the lesion is. These can pinpoint which zone has been affected as well as examine any of the other possibilities such as ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, lower cervical radiculopathy, lower trunk brachial plexopathy or even very rarely motor neuronopathy. Once we are sure that the lesion is at the level of the wrist, a series of tests are required to work out the cause. These will include x-rays to look for any fractures, ultrasound or MRI to look for any other compressive causes, or even more specialised tests to examine ulnar artery problems. Causes are reported to be unidentified in up to 40% of cases. Management absolutely depends on the cause and avoiding any exacerbating factors, thus cysts might have to be removed or fractures repaired. Whilst there have been no randomised controlled trials of treatment, there has been a recent European consensus group which has proposed some guidelines. This was a multidisciplinary group of 112 experts working together to form the Hand Guide Study in 2013. They divide management into non-surgical treatment, which is neutral position wrist splinting for up to three months of mainly nocturnal use, but they do not recommend non-steroidal medications or local steroid injections. They also had insufficient evidence to achieve consensus regarding therapeutic ultrasound treatment or nerve gliding exercises. Interventional treatment with surgery is the other branch of treatment where the nerve is explored and decompressed. Either way, all patients are advised to avoid putting pressure on the wrist and avoid repetitive movements, especially extending the wrist. The type of treatment offered will depend upon the severity of the symptoms and the duration for which they have lasted. Thus, mild to moderate cases lasting a few weeks tend to be managed non-operatively, whereas moderate to severe cases lasting over three months tend to be recommended for surgery. Ulnar artery lesions are, of course, treated somewhat differently and primarily to repair the artery. I hope that this video has provided a good overview about what this condition is all about and I look forward to seeing you in my next video shortly.